So I love this scripture because it's like a Star Trek moment, right? One minute, Philip is there, and the next, he's beamed over to a new realm. It's partly about how does the Spirit move in our lives? What does it look like? And how do we experience it? And what is the Spirit calling us to? In the book of Acts, the Spirit is its own character, its own movement. It has dimension and purpose, and it's changing the world. And so Philip is one of the disciples that was chosen after Jesus has departed. And he's chosen because now they're down a couple disciples. He's chosen to be one of the disciples that will care for the elderly in the community, that will provide food to the widows and orphans. And he takes that job and learns more and more about Jesus, and they are so filled with the Spirit after Pentecost that they can't remain in one place that they need to share the story that they have learned. They need to share about the life-giving, life-changing possibilities of God. But this story about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch is not just an evangelism story. Even though it is mostly always only used as an evangelism story, right? Because what happens? The Spirit says, go to this person, talk to them about your faith, and then they will be baptized, and bam, you'll be on them to the next person, right? Evangelism story. A guy that you could follow. Let the Spirit blow through you to the next person who needs to hear about your faith. Talk about your faith with whatever it is they open up in a reading. Invite them into community and then move on. But there's another layer to this story, another subtext that makes this story even more powerful than just being the mystical flying Philip, right? Because this story takes a person, an Ethiopian eunuch. So what do those words say to you? How does that create an image in your brain? The first thing it says to you is this is a black man, right? That the person that is wealthy in this chariot, that is the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia, is a black man. The next image that comes into your brain is, I don't know what eunuch means. If I do know, I'm not real clear. And if I am clear, we don't want to talk about it. Okay? So for the children present, it means we can no longer have children. But what it says to those of us in the United Church of Christ is that he is a sexual minority. He is a person who has been discriminated against and chased out and only allowed certain roles and opportunities because of his sexuality. So he's black and he's a sexual minority. That changes the story, doesn't it? Because now it goes from being an evangelism story to being a story about inclusion. A story about how do we welcome our neighbors? What does it mean to actually welcome our neighbors? If Jesus teaches us that the most important thing we can do, which we learn recently, right? Love one another. Love your neighbors. Is to love our neighbors. What does that really look like? How do you practice it? What does it mean? And who are our neighbors? Right? Because we want our neighbors to be the people 
people around us, the ones that make us comfortable. And yet in this instant, the Spirit guides Philip to interact with an Ethiopian, Ethiopian unit. And what he, the Spirit does is guides him to the right road he needs to be on and points him into the direction of this chariot. And in the chariot is when he encounters a decision he's going to have to make. How is he going to respond to the Spirit's prompting to include someone who should be kept apart? Okay? So, I don't know how much of the law of Moses was practiced, okay? So I will give you that as a caveat. How much of those three books in the Bible that are all laws did they actually practice? And how much were good ideas and general ways that you should go but weren't really used, right? So one of the laws in Deuteronomy was that eunuchs were not allowed to truly become one of the Jewish people. They were not allowed into the temple space. They could only go so far. They could worship God, but they couldn't become part of the community. There's a verse in there about eunuchs that says they aren't allowed. So Philip has a choice to make. Will he follow the Spirit's prompting that says this one? Not only is he black, but he's a sexual minority. And my religion tells me to say no to him. Will he say yes? So the first decision in this passage is for Philip to say, I'm going to listen to the Spirit. That's telling me that love does not care about where you're from and about your sexual status. And then he sits there with the eunuch and says, so what are you reading? And the eunuch says, I've got this, this book about Isaiah. And he, they share that passage. And so Philip then asked the next question, right? He asked that question about what are you reading? But the eunuch, who is smart and well-educated, says back to Philip about this passage, how can I know what it means if no one will teach me? Okay? Because what we learned about the Ethiopian eunuch is that he had been in Jerusalem worshiping. We don't know what he was worshiping, who he was worshiping, how he was worshiping. We just know he was worshiping. And now he has a scroll of Isaiah. Okay? So he could be one of the dysphoria, meaning one of the Jewish people that has been spread all around the world and is coming back for a religious event. Or he could be a convert. But either way, he came up against a barrier that said, this is as far as you can go and no farther. And so he said back to Philip, and Philip has another choice at this point. Do I talk to him where he's at about the subject he wants to know? Or do I let it go? And Philip again makes the choice to follow the promptings of the Spirit and talk to him about Jesus. Sharing with him what Jesus did in his ministry, how he lived his life, about what it means to welcome a neighbor. And as they're having this discussion, they come upon a body of water. 
and Ethiopian eunuch says to them, Here's some water. Will you baptize me? He's asking me to be part of the community. He's asking to be brought into the fold, to be one of those who follow Jesus. And so Philip has another decision. Will he remain in the past, in what was, in the traditions of old? Or will he embrace what the Spirit is calling him to and invite this man into the community to become part of their presence? And so he baptizes the man and then gets to fly away to the next spot. But this story speaks to us a lot about who our neighbor is, right? I don't have answers to all questions. But I have questions that we can ask about our neighbors. Just based on this story. If this story says that God opened up the community to the Ethiopians, how can we be closing the community to our black brothers and sisters? One example, they decided in some of the states that you are no longer a give, allowed to give people food and water while they're waiting in line. Question, how long have you ever waited in line to vote? Answer, 15 minutes at the most, but you're from a small town, so probably not even that, right? You walk in, they find your name, you vote. If you're waiting four hours in line, what happened to make that happen, right? And it isn't just because of a small town, because I voted in Chicago when I lived there. I've never had to wait four hours. A question, how do we welcome our neighbors? Another question, about sexual minorities. Trans kids are the most likely to commit suicide of any child in this country. How can we not treat them with respect and dignity and love? They are children. Children. You don't have to agree with them to honor them. You don't have to welcome them to let them live their lives. And we have decided in too many of our states that we are going to pass laws punishing trans children. Children. Jesus talks to us about loving one another. This story says that the Spirit prompted Philip to expand who's included and who is part of us and who is welcome. And how can we do any less? Amen.